What's up, what's up, what's up, everybody? My name is Dan Kornhauser. And my name is Bobby Hunt. Thank you guys for tuning in as Bob and I take you on yet another journey into the world of sports. This time, we're talking NFL draft. It happened, what, a week ago or more at this point? And uh, two weeks ago. It's crazy. Jesus Christ, dude. It's, it's yeah, it's time been a while. Uh, we were celebrating Bob's wedding during the draft, and it was a blast. And we didn't miss any of the draft, coincidentally, because all the activities were taking place later in the day and stuff like that. We did carve out a whole night for round one. We had a good time in rounds two and three. And of course, because I'm a damn fiend, I thoroughly enjoyed as much as I could of the third day. But uh, that was that was secondary to, to the celebration of Bob's wedding. But uh, now that we've had some time to process things, and I will be completely uh, candid with you guys at the moment and say that I was absolutely disgusted initially with the Detroit Lions draft. And I know how much you guys love to hear me verbally abuse my teams. And I know just how much joy Bob gets out of it personally as well, because I'm relentless as much as I am of a fan of my teams. I am also their biggest, harshest critic, but you know, it's balanced, Bob. You got to take the go with the bad. Oh, absolutely. And I wasn't totally happy with my team's draft, especially on that first day. Like you said, we were celebrating my wedding. We were actually in Mexico for it. And that first day when you guys got there on Thursday, we went out, had some, a lot of drinks, not some drinks. No, we had some, <laughs> had a, we had some drinks. A lot it. of drinks. Got to watch the draft <laughs> on NFL Network yep. there at a bar and had a great time. And at least for that first day, I definitely liked the Lions draft more than the Giants draft. But you're right. We love to hear you crap on your teams. Everybody loves to hear it. I think that kind of radio, I know we're doing a podcast, but that is usually what you refer to it as. It makes for good radio. When I mean, you're critical. People want to hear harsh words and then criticism. It's not all honky dory and, and wonderful and rainbows and sunshine. And I wasn't as happy as, uh, as I could have been on day one, at least. Uh, but, you know, we'll get to the Giants a little later because it was a mixed bag for sure. But I think you should be happy as a Lions fan. I'll, all in all well i know the uh this whole off season i've been pondering what what teams i was going to switch to and i say teams because i was so disgusted with the lions over the last decade plus that i really started giving a shit about them and they just every off season just did dumb move after dumb move constantly and i wanted to punch everyone in that whole organization in the face Everyone from top to bottom, T to B, and it just they just upset me more times than than they made me happy with their free agent moves, their coaching hires, their draft picks. Don't even get me going on Todd uh, on uh, Hawkinson. All right, don't, don't even get me going. On TJ Hawk. Hawkinson, fucking TJ Hawk. All right, don't don't get me going on that man. Of course, but, you took him in fantasy last year, but I digress. Listen, I, just because I hate the man doesn't mean I'm stupid. All right, I, I knew he would have elite tight end potential but anyway that's neither here nor there we'll talk about fantasy stuff later in the summer we'll be, as we get closer to training camp and all that but um let's let's dive right into it bob there's a lot of stuff that went down the first round wasn't as crazy as everyone had uh predicted with the trades in the top 10 and all that stuff but it was a fun first round there were to be nice Some interesting picks, as there always is in the first round, particularly that first night. I'm talking about you, uh, Raiders. (laughs) Gross. Did not like their draft. They they always tend to do something fun during the draft, and they definitely stick to their boards uh, despite what popular opinion might be or what other people say. They stick to their board, and they, they, they do their thing. So kudos to them for sticking with their laurels and trusting their uh, their scouting department and what, and whatever they came up with, but um, gross. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to start with that, with the Raiders, just, just gross. But honestly, the, the first round wasn't too crazy. It, it, there wasn't anything that made, made me say, Oh, what the hell are these guys doing? What a terrible pick. I mean, even, even the Raiders pick. Yeah, sure. Alex Leatherwood. I had him at number 40 on my big board, but that's, I don't want that to be seen as an indictment on the player. I, I don't have that many first round grades to begin with this year. I think I had uh 20 something first round grades overall. 
Uh, matter of fact, I'll tell you exactly. Yeah, I had 26 total first round grades, which is by far the most first round grades I've ever had uh, in any NFL draft that I've been covering in the last, what, decade plus that we've been fiending on this stuff. So this is this was a very good draft class, but it was a really weird one because one one prevailing theme that that kept popping up throughout the draft was guys who sat out suffered. The guys who sat out dropped. And I mean, I guess that would be a little bit predicted with guys who aren't those upper echelon hoes, the Micah Parsons of the world, the uh, Penny Sewells of the world, the guys who didn't play, but it didn't freaking matter. You know, Jamar Chase didn't matter because you, you already had the tape you needed. You already knew they had the measurables. They had the stats. Them sitting out, it didn't affect them. But it affected a lot, pretty much everybody else. Whoever wasn't a first-round pick who sat out, it affected everybody else. And some guys fell way down the board. We saw a lot of safe picks as a result, too. And that was <laughs> kind of what people were thinking would happen leading up to the draft because these teams weren't able to have guys come to their facilities and work them out on their own. Mm -hmm. There was no scouting combine. They just had the pro days that they could attend. And in, especially in the first 10 to 15 picks, we saw a lot of guys that we expected that were on the top 10 to 15 of most draft boards. Yep. You, you had obviously number one and number two were set in stone. We knew it would be Lawrence and Wilson in our mock drafts. I took Trey Lance. You went with Mac Jones bought into some of the rumors that didn't turn out to be true, but either way, Mac Jones still winds up going in the top 15 yep. and then all the receivers, Waddle, Smith, Chase all went in the top, what? 10. Pitts. Sewell went in the top 10. Uh, you had, they said Horn and Sertan Pitts, would be Horn, top 10. Exactly. Picks. Horn and Sertan. So a lot of the, a lot of it went kind of according to plan. It was just a matter of where exactly they went. Yep. That was maybe uh, not expected in those, in those, in, you know, who, what team was going to necessarily take them. But definitely a lot of the top prospects that everyone had on their boards went in those first 10 to 15 picks. So there weren't a ton of surprises. Of course, later on in the draft, we had the Raiders take a bit of a surprise and a couple other late first rounders, as we always expect. Teams that reach for whatever reason, especially when you look at teams like the Raiders or the Seahawks. Seahawks didn't have a first rounder, of course, because of the Jamal Adams trade. But for the most part, very safe picks. Yeah. And I mean, it makes sense. Like you said, with all those factors coming in COVID, no scouting combine, et cetera. Like we heard the rumors that, well, teams might lean more towards being conservatives, knowing going with the guys that they've seen on tape this year, right. that they were able to get more information on. And like, and like I said, if it wasn't one of the elite guys, it, they suffered. And you know what? A lot of, I like what a lot of these teams did. There was, there was, even though it was a weird draft and in a weird season and all that and a weird off season, there's, there's, there was a lot of, I felt like there was a lot of good talent and I, it's not a class overall. That's going to be as good, at least project projection wise as next year's class. Next year's class looks absolutely loaded. It looks ridiculous. We're talking about, quarterback you know five six quarterbacks potentially going in the first round again we might have a guy from liberty playing quarterback who might go in the top three michael number one overall kids are walking a uh, highlight reel um we've got receivers tons of receivers and skill position players coming out edge a couple of solid elite edge rushers which we didn't really have this year no. some elite defensive linemen which we did not have this year it's a really really good class next year and i'm actually surprised with a couple of the trades that went down uh, i'm looking at you chicago because they traded up to get justin fields which was a fantastic decision and a fantastic move for the franchise However, the fact that they traded their first round pick next year, it was a fair trade. They didn't give up too much. It wasn't the 49ers giving up three first round picks like it's like it's draft day. And uh, who, who was uh, Bo Callahan? If, yeah, if I'm Bo Callahan's on the board, like, no, they, you know, they there wasn't anything like that, like the 49ers gave up. So it was a good trade, very solid. But I questioned them giving up a first round pick next year because the class is so loaded and this team I'm looking at their, their roster right now. You have their draft, uh, their draft. Um, I'm sorry, their depth chart up uh, here on your screen and it's okay. Their defense has some pieces, but 
outside of Allen Robinson, it's threatening. I love that they got Tevin Jenkins in the second round. Absolutely love that. That's one of the more underrated moves, I, I think, of, of this whole draft. I'm shocked that he dropped to the second round, to be completely honest, because he had, I mean, the tape is, I, I talked this guy up during the draft. The tape is something real, real special. He's just throwing guys around, getting to the second level, anchoring when he needs to. You see the length clearly on tape. I had him, I had him ranked in the top 20, my top 20. I'm sorry. I had 19th overall on my big board for a reason. And I'm glad you brought up the Bears because they did have one of my favorite drafts, regardless of the fact that they traded that first round pick, traded it to the Giants. Like I said, we'll get to them a little later. But Fields was our number two quarterback for both our boards yep. ahead of Zach Wilson, who wound up going number two. So they get Justin Fields at number 11 where the Giants were going to pick. But Giants, as usual, telegraphed their pick cock and got cock blocked. Yep. Cowboys traded down with the Eagles so the Eagles could take Devontae Smith. That would have been the pick by the Giants. The Giants were disgusted. But the Bears wind up getting their guy, their quarterback. They're not going to be bad enough necessarily to be getting one of those guys next year, even if they hadn't gotten fields, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yes, I don't think of them. Say if they – obviously, Trubisky went to the Bills, and they weren't going to go down that road again. Nope. But I don't know if they were going to bottom out enough to be picking high enough to take one of those quarterbacks next year. So – it's a gamble, of course, and and a, maybe a last ditch one. See, that's the thing too: is the pressure's on Ryan Pace and Matt Nagy to win now. They can't, yep. they can't uh, dick around anymore. Basically, to be honest, they have to try to compete. And so, I like their draft. I, I wouldn't say I love it, but it's definitely one of my favorites. I like getting Fields, number two quarterback on our board, should have been a top ten pick. Then you protect him. You get Tevin Jenkins. In the, in the early second round. You get Larry Borum, tackle out of Missouri. And then Khalil Herber out of Virginia Tech, a school I like to watch. I think he can be a really good back for them. Now, it's not a big need. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing I question because, yeah, because you, still have, you still have Montgomery, you still have Cohen, but it's a fourth-round pick, so I'm not going to go crazy about it. But basically, they're, they're showing we need to get better on offense. I think they could still use help defensively, and they're getting a little old on that side of the ball. But they're still very solid. There's, I don't worry too much about the defense. They said, we need an upgrade over Trubisky. Mm-hmm. We need to protect our young quarterback, our young investment as well. And they have a couple weapons. They have Allen Robinson still in the fold, which is extremely crucial. Mm-hmm. Had they lost him, it would be very fugly. Mm. Uh, Jimmy Graham had a decent year. Certainly seen much better days with the Saints a long time ago at this point. But that O-line looks solid now. James Daniels, Cody Whitehair in the middle of it. You can start Tevin Jenkins at left to right tackle from day one. Yep. So I like what the Bears did. And I think this team, especially if Rodgers were to get traded at all, I don't think it'll happen. But clearly they're at a standstill and a standoff between him and the GM. Yep. So this division could be very interesting next year. Who knows? Because we know Cousins doesn't excite us with Minnesota. Mm-mm. And even with the Lions having a solid draft, they're clearly rebuilding. So I think the Bears position themselves where – they can at the very least compete for a wild card spot next year, especially considering that there's now seven playoff teams as opposed to six. And there are a lot of other teams that are a lot worse than the Bears. I mean, right off the top, the Texans, the Jaguars, the Bengals, the Jets, the Lions, Broncos. I mean, depending on how the quarterback position comes along, any one of those teams could be in the top five next year. So there's there you know we'll see how everything plays out but yeah you're right you know i don't think the bears are one of the worst teams that they could end up in the top five for for one of these upper echelon quarterbacks that are available next year and like i said even though there's going to be like you know five or six quarterbacks in the first round potentially uh with first round grades depending on who declares and and so on and so forth won't really matter for them and they made the right move justin fields was a great pickup one of my favorite uh picks of the entire draft let alone the first night But, Bob, I got to ask you, of the first round, which pick pick was your favorite? One that stood out in the first round where you you saw it and they made it, and you're like, damn, that was a great pick. It fit the scheme. It fits a need. He's an immediate starter most likely. Like, what, 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 what first rounder stood out to you that really something special? One that pops into my mind at the moment is Rashawn Slater for, to the Chargers at number 13. There's talk about him maybe going to the top 10 as high as potentially number eight mm-hmm. to the Carolina Panthers. 
And for the last couple of years, I've been very unimpressed by the Chargers offensive line. There's no standout guy on that line. No one you look at as like a franchise player or one of the top five to 10 at the position. Now, uh, it wasn't an awful line, but definitely, like you said, mediocre at best. At best. And so now they get a player who some people even had a head of Sewell. I don't. I didn't believe that at all. I didn't buy into that hype to that extent. Me neither. But I do think he can be, be a tackle at the next level. I don't worry about his short arms. Not at all. And he can slide in at either left or right tackle right away. And with a quarterback like Justin Herbert, again, kind of like what I just talked about with the Bears, you want to protect your investment. You want to protect your young quarterback. So I think that's a real home run pick for the Chargers for a number of reasons. And we've talked about this in past draft reviews, as always. You love when a team not only goes for a need, but gets value at that need and a guy who you could see being a 10 to 15 year starter. And that's what they got. They picked him in the right range. Mm -hmm. So they got the correct value. It's definitely a need for them. And when you have a young quarterback who showed a lot of great things last year, Justin Herbert was amazing last season. That's, that's important. That that's huge for the chargers. Mm -hmm. I just hope he can stay healthy because we know the chargers always are snake bitten by injuries, but I think that's a home run pick for them. And another team that actually was one of my favorite drafts, the fact that they also were able to get Asante Samuel jr. In the second round, because again, a very good value where they took them yep. and filled the need that they desperately needed on that side of the ball. The Chargers now have, after that pick and the moves that they made this offseason, they might have one of the very best offensive lines in the entire league. They are truly stacked. And that's that's a different thing to say out loud because, as you said, the Chargers O-lines have always been mediocre but Slater at left tackle Corey Lindsay who they added in the offseason from Green Bay at center Matt Feeler from Pittsburgh who they added to start at right guard Balaga at right tackle I mean that's a hell of an offensive line and they've got options they do like Trey Pimp, uh, Pipkins who they drafted in 2019 in the third round he's a nice swing tackle for him I don't like O'Day uh, Abushi at left guard formerly of Detroit but when four of the five starters on the line are solid to above average you can get away with a an average to below average left guard. And I think in my mock draft, I had them take them to Vontae Smith, but obviously he wasn't available there. Granted, it would have been uh, an embarrassment of riches if they got him. They already have Keenan William, Keenan yep. Allen, sorry, Keenan Allen and Mike Williams mixed up the <laughs> names there. Pull to me. But basically uh, I thought, all right, you want to help Herbert out, but they, Smith wasn't there and they did help Herbert out. Tackle is definitely more important. And when you consider that they do have good weapons there, they did lose Hunter Henry but they're able to bring in a tight end like Trey McKitty in the what third round, I believe they drafted him. So he might be able to help out there. They also signed Jared cook in the off season. Mm -hmm. So they made some nice moves. Like you mentioned to bolster the O-line, but I think Jared cooks and also underrated pickup now. Yes. He's seen better days and he's what 33 or 34 at least by now, <laughs> but at least he's a dependable tight end and you know what you can expect out of him at this point. And given that there wasn't a lot of uh, tight ends available out there after the Patriots snatched up their Hunter Henry and John U. Smith from the Titans, I think that's an underrated pickup and a guy that will really help Justin Herbert be a safety blank. He doesn't need to even be the, the second best option. They have Williams and Allen and even Austin Eckler out of the backfield is a great option. So yep. I look at the Chargers, and you're right. I think that offense can be one of the best easily when you consider how good Herbert was last year, all those weapons Special. and everything they did to improve the line between the draft and free agency. You just hope the new coaching staff can keep that momentum rolling with all these additions and, and help his development move along. Absolutely. And of course, this, the injuries is really the biggest problem. I, I, I don't think either of us really thought Anthony Lynn was a terrible coach. Uh, he still made too many mistakes, and that's why he wound up being ousted. But they always dealt with injuries. Hopefully, they they can just avoid that. I think they're just snake bin. I don't think it's anything to do with the training staff. It's almost like the Yankees over these last few years. It's, yeah. I don't, they changed the training staff. Guys still are getting muscle injuries. It just it it unfortunately happens. happens. Yeah. But uh, I do think the Chargers uh, arrow is pointing up for sure. Absolutely. Now, for me, my favorite pick of the first round was a bit later. And this was one of my picks I got right in my mock draft. And that was Rashad Bateman, uh, wide receiver from Minnesota, going over to the Baltimore Ravens at 27th overall. I think that was one of my for show picks where yeah. I, penned that I penned it in a month ago. 
and I haven't changed it since. Uh, they have Marquise Brown, as we know. They brought in Sammy Watkins uh, as a free agent. And they have those tight ends, uh, as we know, and Nick Boyle in it and Mark Andrews. So they've got, they've, had, they've got weapons in the passing game, but Lamar Jackson needed more. And Rashad Bateman steps in from week one, automatic starter on the outside. But the special thing about, is, about him is you don't have to just – he's not pigeonholed to the outside. You can move him around. And you can use him a lot like the Chargers use Keenan Allen. And I say Keenan Allen, and that's high praise. I know how high of a praise that is. And Bob, you know how critical I've been about Keenan Allen over the course of his career because the guy just can't stay healthy. He just had problems early in his career. It was always something with this guy, and I hated it. And just he's not flashy, but he's solid. And, I mean, I can't hate. The man's a pro bowler. He's every year is one of the top receivers when he's healthy and it is what it is. He's, he's an elite wide receiver. So sprinkling the name Keenan Allen out there when speaking about uh, Bateman is, is high lofty praise. I don't think Bateman is going to be a pro bowler from week one. I, I think part of that has to do with the limitations. Lamar Jackson has been showing at quarterback, particularly in the postseason when things tighten up and defenses are better, but Bateman's an, an elite route runner at Minnesota, he ran a complete route tree or damn near. He can go inside. He can be out an outside guy. He catches with his hands. You see a lot of these receivers coming out of college. They need some refinement because they're, they're what we call body catchers. Like they'll get their hands on it, but they try to like, you know, uh, catch it into their bodies as they run and try to secure it that way. This guy plucks it out of the air and he's, on, uh, he's ready to make the next move. He's not Marquise Brown. He's not the fastest guy in the field. He's not going to outrun the whole defense on a screen, but he'll make those contested catches for Lamar Jackson. He was an amazing value where they took him. I was a little surprised he was still on the board and a bunch of teams actually passed on him, but they, I think they got away with a steal in in Bateman. And if he's not going to be their number one wide receiver by the end of this year, next year, he'll step into that role very nicely. You were right about him being a for show. Unfortunately, I didn't pick him at, 27 where he wound up going i had him at the second ravens pick so i only got a half a point for that but i definitely liked him to the ravens it makes a ton of sense and then to me he'll be like a former minnesota receiver that i think is similar in a lot of ways and eric decker eric decker was another receiver who plucked the ball out of the air good route runner and maybe didn't profile as a a number one or a high-end number one but definitely like a low-end wide receiver one or definitely a really good number two wide receiver, and he should complement Marquise Brown very well. Marquise Brown is one of those guys who's a bit of a body catcher, Mm -hmm. but we know he is explosive. He's had his ups and downs, but if you put Rashad Bateman on the opposite side of him, I think that'll allow him to flourish. It'll benefit Bateman, and clearly the Ravens needed to surround Lamar Jackson with more options besides just Andrews and an inconsistent Marquise Brown. So I definitely think it's a good pick for the Ravens. Yeah, if they want – Lamar Jackson to take that next step as a passer because we already know what he is as an athlete and we know he can spin the ball he's got a pretty spiral so the the talent is there they just got to harness it and he's one of those guys where like a Drew Brees a Tom Brady Ben Roethlisberger the elite of the elite bring these uh, receivers up they make receivers good they make their offensive line good because they themselves are that good they elevate those around them Lamar Jackson has had that shot and he hasn't been able to do it so Bateman will help one for the Lamar Jackson marks they were saying oh he needs more help well no more excuses you bring in Rashad Bateman Mm -hmm. yes Sammy Watkins isn't as sexy as he used to be when we thought he was one of the best receivers coming into that draft in 2014 clearly isn't as good as some of the other guys that were drafted in that draft class but still he's only going to be expected to be a third receiving third wide receiver option because mark andrews is clearly ahead of him and i expect jk dobbins to be a lot better in year two than he was in year one Mm -hmm. definitely had more of a role as the season wore on so i think they have the pieces in place it does hurt to lose orlando brown but alejandro villanueva he's also a player who is advanced in age not nothing anything to get excited about but at least they're putting him at right Solid, tackle yeah. yeah they're not putting him at left tackle like he had been for the Steelers they have Ronnie Stanley so I think Lamar Jackson's out of excuses if we still see a Ravens playoff game and he's throwing for 100 yards it's on him I don't want to mm-hmm. hear it I agree wholeheartedly so there's we've we've discussed a lot there um 
I like it so far. But let's let's move on from the first round because there's seven rounds. There were uh, 259 total selections, and there's 32 teams that to talk about. Now we're not going to talk about all 32 teams. There's not enough time for that. As much as I would love to, and we can absolutely talk for a couple of hours about this straight and not get tired. We're fiends. This is this is what we do. But we're going to spare you guys, so it's not going to be a three-hour show. We're going to try to keep it around an hour, hopefully. But uh, but let's let's move forward from the first round. There's there's still a lot to unpack here. So from your favorite pick in the first round, let's 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 flip it. All right, what outside of the first round? Okay, because the first round was pretty ho hum, pretty straightforward. Not much to get too upset about there. Outside of the first round, Bob, who would you say what what player was taken in a spot where you just like? what the hell is this team <laughs> thinking? What? Why? Why take, you know, it could be a player that you don't think fits their scheme. It could be a player who you had ranked a lot lower. Cause I mean, in the first round, I think for both of us, we would probably say uh, somebody like Stokes, right. Green Bay well, Stokes and Leatherwood or, or Leatherwood. So that's pretty straightforward. Everybody hated those picks. So, yeah, I mean, and you got to imagine how, uh, Aaron Rodgers felt about that Stokes pick in the first round. He probably wanted to light the house on fire, but um, that aside, what was, what was one of your least favorite picks outside of the first round? Well, we definitely hated the pick when we saw it on that second day, when we were down in Mexico on that Friday was Tutu Atwell to the Rams because they already have receivers. Mm -hmm. Now, I get it. They could use a third one. It's not like Josh Reynolds is anything to get excited about. I'm pretty sure Reynolds even left the team. I think oh, he's you're in right. Tennessee now. But you have what? But Cooper regardless, Cuff, Robert yeah. Woods. I don't see the point in drafting what a guy who's like five six at best and like one fifty or one sixty soaking wet. He's very small. Uh, now it's nice if he can help return, but I just don't like him as a second round pick especially when this is a deep wide receiver class. It's just one that I don't think they need it. They still need help at other, on other parts of their team. They could still use an old lineman as an upgrade. They could use a bigger receiver, in my opinion. I mean, not that, that Woods and Cup, Cup are small. They're actually yeah. bigger than people think. But they're still not anything imposing at all. Fair. They could use some tight end help. Uh, you look on their defense. Uh, I'm not, I can't get excited about some of their linebackers, especially in the middle of that defense ugly. at all. It's so ugly. ugly. So to me, I think Tutu Atwell's a reach there. I didn't like that pick. And then if I had to put it in a tie, I really didn't like the Bucks taking Kyle Trask. I think Tom Brady clearly wants to play a few more years, and I don't think it's necessarily a knock on Kyle Trask. But and I know they're okay. So it's not clearly to me Atwell is way worse. Mm-hmm. But with Trask, it's just one of those things to me where all right, you did win a Super Bowl, so obviously it's not like there's that pressure anymore to win win one with Tom there. Right, but. To me, it's pretty obvious. Tom's playing at least two more seasons. So it's not like you need the replacement for this year. And he's a solid quarterback, but I don't I don't see starter at all in him. If I saw like a diamond in the rough, okay, I could get it more. But I think he's one of those players who, yeah, can carve out a 10 year career, but primarily as a backup and a spot Mm -hmm. starter. So to me, when you have, yeah, okay, you bring back all 22 starters. But I'd still want to improve my depth. I'd still want to maybe bolster the O-line or get especially D-line help because so you have old players like Jason Pierre-Paul and, Do- and Dominic and Sue that need to be spelled. Uh, even their secondary. They've bolstered their secondary over the years and put a lot of picks in it. But mm-hmm. still, we've talked about it. We're not so to- totally high on all their, their corners and safeties. So to me, I didn't love the Kyle Trask pick. I get it in a sense that they – want to maybe develop a guy that can take over in a few years but right. to me it was just a pick that was unnecessary if they they could have waited till at least the third round or or fourth round to pick up a quarterback that they want to develop i mean i didn't hate the the, the trask pick the the two two out well i didn't like it i don't know if 57 overall was a, a good place to take him especially considering, like you said, the other talent on the board and their other needs. I mean, Nick Bolton went one pick later, uh, the linebacker from Missouri, went one pick later to, to Kansas City. You're telling me Nick Bolton wouldn't have been a starter on this team? Now, the, the, the Rams also, like you said, have 
four wide receivers, Cooper Cup, Woods, Van Jefferson from Florida right. that they drafted last year. And the Deshaun's round. the main one I forgot about. And they about. signed Deshaun Jackson as a free agent. So I think for them, Tutu Atwell gives them an option when Deshaun Jackson inevitably gets hurt. <laughs> Cooper Cup also seems to have injury problems. So maybe they're just trying to plan around that. Jackson is on a one-year deal. And maybe this might be the last time we see Robert Woods. The last season we see Robert Woods in a Rams uniform. Who knows? But, I, you know, I can jive with that. I had Atwell as a 120 overall uh, on my big board. So him going, one fifth, uh, going 57th is uh, it's a little rich for my blood. But even to that end, that wasn't even my, my least favorite pick in the second round. I mean, for me, I was looking at, at guys like Kelvin Joseph and Walker Little. And for different reasons for Joseph, it was more off the field concerns than physical talent. Joseph uh, Joseph corner from Kentucky went to Dallas uh, 44th overall. I had him at 114 on my board. And again, it wasn't because of any physical limitations, but it was mostly off the field issues, how he fit in certain defenses. And there were questions. So I figured, you know, a 114 third, fourth round would be fair for him. He could develop into a starter, but he's going to uh, a Cowboys team that, will need him right away that whole secondary is revamped they got moving pieces in and out this whole this offseason so it's a completely rebuilt secondary that defense was absolute trash last season just garbage it didn't matter when Dak Prescott was healthy that they were dropping 30 40 points every game because they're losing 41 to 40 and, and pissing everybody off so they needed to upgrade their defense and I'm pretty sure they pulled uh, a Panthers and picked nothing but def- uh, defensive players. I'm just looking at their class now. And of, of all their picks, one, two, three, four, five, six, their first six picks were on the defensive side of the ball. And eight of their 10, pi- eight of their 11 picks were on the defensive ball altogether. And they addressed all three levels of the defense. But spoiler alert, the Cowboys were one of my least favorite drafts uh, of, of any of these teams. They just took reach after reach after reach, according to my board. And these not to say these players aren't solid pieces and that they won't fit into the team, but Joseph was just the beginning. I, I had I just, look, just overall looking at it, I'm getting grossed out. I just, I hate it. But for me, it was, it was a combination of Joseph and, uh, and Walker, um, Walker Little, the st- tackle from Stanford. Now he went to Jacksonville 45th overall. I had him at 111 on my board. He's not bad. He's not a terrible piece. I mean, at one point he was looked at as a first round tackle, potential top five, top 10 pick, but that was two years ago. The kids played one game in the last two seasons. He missed time for injury. Then I think this past season, he just opted out. So you're, you're, you're picking a guy in the second round. Yes. The Jaguars needed some, some depth on the offensive line, but you're picking a guy who hasn't played in two years. He's literally played one game in two seasons. The talent is there, but I question why take him in the second round? You really think he wasn't going to be there in the fourth, fifth round? And it's another one, not an indictment of his talent that I had him at 111 on my board, but in, in a year where teams couldn't meet players, they couldn't interview players, they couldn't work them out, they couldn't touch them, they couldn't do anything. Why would you risk a second round pick on a guy who hasn't played in two years? It just doesn't make any well, sense to me. To me and I, he's not even going to be a starter for them right away well, because they're set at tackle. Well, that's why I like the pick actually, because, all right, so I get what you're saying. Second round, maybe not, but I don't think he was going to last the fourth round. I think the talent alone and the fact that at one time he was viewed as a potential top 10 pick, that's what the Jaguars figure. Plus the Jaguars had a ton of picks. What was True. either? He wound up being what their fourth pick yeah. overall. So that that's probably what factored into it. And they figure, all right, we don't need to start him right away. So it's not, we're not reaching in a sense and saying, oh man, you got to start from tackle day one. And at the same time, it's also not like their tackles are going to be there for the next five to 10 years. Right. Cam Robinson and Juwan Taylor still have plenty to prove. I'm not sold on them as stalwarts or anything. They're decent pieces and young players. So I don't think they're going to be awful, but I think they look at it like, hey, and well, you got to factor in Urban Meyer as well the talk around their first two day picks was the fact that a lot of the guys that he selected that urban Meyer had an input in on now. Yeah. He's not the GM, but of course he's going to have heavy influence given the contract they gave him and the clout he just generally has, even if it was from college, right. They took 
players that he's he scouted previously and was recruiting when they were in high school yep. walker little being one of them that's true jay Tefelli later on with, from usc so he was looking at players that i'm familiar with i really liked i know they have the talent they performed in high school and so i think they look at it like all right walker little doesn't need to do anything right away but we already took uh, the stud quarterback we took his teammate etienne and we got other p- good pieces that we drafted like Tyson Campbell, who I like out of Georgia. So they they filled some immediate needs. But then I think to to take Walker Little, it's saying we're not totally sold on our offensive line, and this guy can just learn. He doesn't ha- have to play right away. I'm very intrigued by the Jaguars, too. I'm looking forward to doing our uh, NFL season preview uh, later on this summer, you know, July, August, whenever we happen to start doing this and breaking down the teams more in-depth and giving each team and each division their – they're due and, and giving them some love where we're appropriate because the Jaguars got a really interesting roster. Now they've had a really solid off season. I am very, very curious to see what urban Meyer does in, in the pros considering the coaching staff he's put together is a bunch of college coaches and, and whatever. It's pretty much a college all-star coaching lineup. Pretty much. If Trevor Lawrence is the stud we expect him to be from the, from jump street, they can compete for that division. It's it sounds crazy to say, but we know the Texans suck. The Colts hit I, or miss. Hit or miss. We don't know what we don't think their quarterback position is solved at all. Even with Brain and Carson Wentz, yep. he has a lot to prove. And then the Titans should definitely be the best team in that division. But they've been the same team for the last couple of years. At some point, you know, Ryan Tannehill isn't a top five quarterback. Right. Not at all. Not well. He play he Greg will say that he's been a top five quarterback the last two years. He's been a top ten, that's, maybe that's or top ten at worst. Greg would say, but that's a little rich for my blood because I I see past the stats. Sit, the right, lines. statistically, he had top ten years, but you don't go into the playoffs super confident in him. Absolutely not. So let's let's keep moving forward because there's there's a lot of there's a lot of things I can get into with picks play. It's I mean you could say it's nitpicking, but. There's a lot of picks that happened that I was very confused about. Uh, surprisingly, most of them were uh, Cowboys picks, but that's neither here nor there. We'll we'll circle back to our most favorite and, and least favorite draft classes in a little bit. But let's again flip it back over from a pick that we hated to a pick that we liked. What what later round pick, a non first or second round pick, would you say stands out to you again? Mm-hmm. The opposite fits good scheme, good team fits the need potential starter right away or fills a very important role right away. Is there anyone outside of the first or second round that that stands out to you in particular that 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 could make an impact with his new team right away? Uh, Well, one that popped in mind is isn't necessarily a third round or later, but I do like that the Giants got Aziz Ojolari in the second round at Love pick it. 51. Love that. Now, maybe <laughs> the Giants aren't a good team. Yes, they are my team, but I know they were 6-10 and 10 last year and still have been a disappointment for the last five years. But the fact that they got what some people consider the best uh, pass rusher in the draft or someone that could have gone in that 10-15 to 15 range potentially, mm-hmm. they got him at 51. And I do think he fits a three, four. Well, it has probably the best bend of any pure pass rusher, especially for that scheme of anyone that was available in the draft. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, there's some injury concerns there, but I think given his athletic profile and the fact that he is going to be able to bend around the edge and, you know, is actually a complete player. I love that pick for the giants. I think that's what made me not hate the giants draft so much is because not only the first round pick that they acquired from the bears, but the fact that old Jalari was there. And I, I did also like their third round pick getting Robinson from UCF. I think they bolstered a couple of positions that they really needed help at. So they didn't have a good first round grade or first day grade for me, but I think on the second day they hit some home runs with their picks because they fit great value and great need. Maybe, yeah, they really stepped it up after that first round. I know how repulsed you were. And it actually made me feel really good inside <laughs> that Bob was so, so disgusted. Like, I love Bob to death, but he's got a dumb face and his anguish really makes me smile sometimes. Yeah, I don't, I don't hide it. I was disgusted years ago. Usually I've been generally happy with a lot of the Giants picks, but you know I was disgusted when we took Eric Flowers and Eli Apple. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't make no bones about it. 
I defended uh, Daniel Jones and I still jury's out on him, but I, I tell you, tell it like it is. I I'll be honest if I hate their picks or love their picks and I've been wrong and right both ways. Sometimes oh, yeah. they made picks I hated and they wound up being right. Sometimes they made picks I loved and they were terrible. I remember uh, Marvin Austin going in the second round, whatever draft that was, I was like 10 years ago or more now, oh my God. but I thought North that was a Carolina. great pick. Yeah. To North Carolina. And he wound up sucking and doing nothing. In the league. Exactly. Pussy. It didn't affect the team too much. It still won a Super Bowl around that Sucks. time, but he he had no <laughs> no real impact at the time. So you you never know exactly how it's going to pan out. But yeah. and I, I hope Tony's a good pick. But at least they redeemed themselves. Not only getting the first rounder in that in that first round with that trade with the Bears, but also the fact that Ojulari and Robinson fit needs, and they got tremendous value where they took them. I mean, you're not wrong. I I agree with you wholeheartedly on everything you just said. I had Ojolari very high on my board. At one point, I had him as my top pass rusher. I, I kind of backed off from that as the process went on and so on and so forth. But I still had him in my at 15th overall on my big board. And since I don't give out that many first-round grades, he's not a perfect prospect. But he, he has a lot of things that I like. He might be the best pure speed rusher in this draft. Very athletic guy. Like you said, he's got the bend that you look for around the end. And I think he dropped mostly, I want to say, for injury concerns or something along those lines. Uh, but, hey, the other team's passing on him is the Giants' win. And that's an A-plus in my book to get uh, Ojolari at 50th overall. But for me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this, and I know how it's going to sound, <laughs> but if you listen to the podcast and or you know me personally, you know that that this would be farther from the truth. But I really, really like the draft pick of Amon Ross St. Brown by the Detroit Lions. You'll say, but Dan, you're a Lions fan. That's not fair. You're a homer. No, no, I'm not. No, 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 I'm not. Because the Lions suck balls. Well, we sound like homers. We just said our late, we did. our gems. We do, but, you know. <laughs> I have another one I'll sprinkle in. Yeah, but I'll, I have I'll another you, one too. I'll let you go. But I, I like St. Brown mostly because the Lions have nothing at receiver. It's it's St. Brown, uh, Brashad Perriman, Tyrell Williams, and Dan Kornhauser. I'm going to be their starting slot receiver. Might as well be. I mean, I'm not wrong. They, 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 def- they should probably call me. I'm available today. Let's do it. Oh, and, and uh, Cephas, Quintess Cephas. Call me when great. you're down. Yeah, they're, they're always down. Call me down. when you need some. They need, they need everyone. A hot pile of garbage would, would be a great slot <laughs> receiver for them right now. Uh, but I had him at number 62 on my board, and the Lions got him at 112. He could have easily gone in the second or third round. The sheer fact that they got him in the fourth in, is the epitome of a steal for me. It matches need, it matches talent, it matches uh, where he ranks on my big board. It just checks all the boxes. Now, he's not a number one wide receiver, and the Lions hopefully didn't draft him to be that. But he's played inside, he's played outside. He struggled more on the outside as as an outside guy full-time this past year, but if he plays in the slot, which he probably should as a rookie, he'll soak up targets because let's be honest, Jared Goff likes the slot. He likes dumping it off over the middle. That's what they did over and over again to Robert Woods and Cooper Cup on those uh, slants and crossing routes and all that shit. So St. Brown steps into a really, really good situation. Oh, and, and and he'll 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 plug in right away and i like that pick a lot but for a non-lions pick someone that stood out to me i'll give you two robert rochelle the corner from central arkansas that the rams picked at 130 overall i had him at 84 on my big board if this kid was playing at alabama or or texas or something or some big division one school he would have been a first round pick the talent is there. The physical, the physical talent is there. The tape is impressive. He showed well in the postseason circuit. And I don't know how he dropped. I'll have to look into that a bit further. Maybe it's because he went to Central Arkansas. Uh, maybe questions on, on where he might fit. But on a, on a Rams team that needs help at corner, because outside of, of uh, Ramsey, I really don't like what they have at the position. 
Robert Rochelle could could easily be their number three corner from day one, and he could very well be someone who is, if he's not a starter, plays starter snaps as their nickelback or or whatever. But he gives them a really really solid option. Well, didn't Darius Williams have a really good last? Darius year last Williams year? did have a good year, but I don't like one year wonders. I want to see him do it again, and he's currently slated to start opposite of Jalen Ramsey. But that secondary is a mess. I don't like anyone that they have in that secondary. I don't like their safeties. I don't like any of their corners outside those top two. I don't like their linebackers. We'll again, we'll deep dive. We'll do a deep yeah. dive into these teams later on. But I think Robert Rochelle, a fourth round pick, has a great shot to do something special for them right away. And then the other one that I really liked was Trey Smith, the guard from Tennessee. I had him at number 80 on my board. He went 226 to Kansas City, and that Kansas City offensive line is now completely rebuilt. They are fully loaded and ready for another Super Bowl run, and they saw Mahomes get his shit pushed in in the Super Bowl, (laughs) scrambling for his life at 60-70% health, and it was ugly. So they made sure that ain't happening again, and they got a guy in Trey Smith at 226 who could have easily been uh, at one point, he was considered a first-round pick, and he could have easily gone in the second or third round, fourth round even. They got him only in the end of the sixth round. I think a lot of that has to do with his injury history and questions on that front. But the kid's got talent. And for someone who was a f- uh, potential former first-round pick to drop to the sixth round and go to, and go to such a fantastic situation where they've shown that they can develop offensive linemen and make those moves, I think that's a great pick for them. And just another... Another great pickup by a great organization. Well, the other one that I wanted to sprinkle in is the Michael Carter pick by the Jets early on Ooh. in the fourth round. Mm-hmm. A running back that some may have had pegged as pro- potentially their third running back off the board after Najee Harris and Travis Etienne, of course. Yep. But a player who you see as potentially a big fantasy guy, someone that, especially now that he goes to the Jets, definitely an opportunity there for sure. So that's part of the reason why I like to pick not just fantasy, but the fact that he's going to have opportunity. Ty Johnson, LaMichael P. Ryan, nothing to get excited nothing. about at all, nope. considering the Jets <laughs> backfield right now. And yeah, he's a bit undersized, but he has that explosive speed. He has soft hands. So he's someone that you can expect to see good things out of as a runner and a receiver and arguably could have a huge impact even as a fourth rounder. So I think the Jets had a tremendous draft bolstering that just dreadful offense that they had last year. They clearly had a regime change. Now, yes, Joe Douglas has been there, but came in with Adam Gase after Gase was already there. And so now he brings in Robert Sala as a coach that we both like as a hire. They should be tough defensively, probably get the best out of some players that you know maybe aren't household names at all. But on the offensive side, drafted a lot of talent that they can use at their disposal. Zach Wilson obviously goes number two. But then you trade up. You get Elijah Vera Tucker out of USC. You also get Elijah, or Elijah Vera Tucker, sorry. Vera Tucker out of USC. And then Elijah Moore out of Ole Miss early on in the second round. And then Michael Carter at running back. They infused some talent and some speed that they desperately needed. Mm-hmm. They couldn't survive on what they had last year. So now you, all right, still, the wide receivers are still not anything terribly great at all, mm-hmm. but bringing in more, who some people thought could go in the first round, didn't want to go in the first round, but a game breaker. Carter could be a game breaker. Mm-hmm. Zach Wilson looks like a playmaker at quarterback. The Jets, to me, had one of the best drafts out of, uh, out of anybody in this draft and also had a ton of picks, which helps, but they, they, they seemingly nailed them based on value and need. I love that you brought up the Jets because we're going to use that. Damn it, Bob. Such a such a damn good segue. It's almost like we've done this before. We're going to take that. We're going to segue and we're going to go talk about the New York area teams. The Jets, the Giants, and we have to talk about the Bills. They are in New York. It is a thing. Benny is a Bills fan. They are one of the best teams in the league. But we'll get to them in a hot second. Let's stick with the Jets for the moment. I agree with you wholeheartedly, Bob. Everything you just said, the Jets had a fantastic draft. It's a great start for Robert Sala. I'm disgusted the Lions did not pick him as their head coach, but that's neither here nor there. Our loss is the Jets win, and they're definitely a better team today than they were when the uh, the offseason started. And, I mean, you can say that for 
pretty much every team damn near in the league except for the Texans. But they really impressed me this offseason. This draft was just the cherry on top that they needed. They filled a bunch of holes, and it goes beyond Zach Wilson, their quarterback, their, their, their new uh, savior there. It goes beyond that. It goes beyond Vera Tucker. It goes beyond more. I mean, these are that's one, two, three starters guaranteed right there from week one. Even if you want to say, oh, well, Jamison Crowder, if I'm them, get rid of Jamison Crowder. You got Elijah Moore. He's he's the same thing, just faster, more athletic and younger and cheaper. And you don't need Jamison Crowder. So, you know, trade him to Detroit for a second. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trade him to Detroit. Jamison Crowder is a good player. He's a good player. And he's been their top receiver the last couple of years. But that is more, I think, of an indictment on their available talent at the position than it is how good Jamison Crowder really is. I think it was a perfect blend of them having trash at the position for the last two years and also having a quarterback who was seeing ghosts and like dumping it off to him. Uh, But regardless, enough shitting on Jamison Crowder for a hot second. I love everything that the Jets did. Their first three picks should be starters from day one. Michael Carter might even be a starter from day one. At the very least, uh, him and Tevin Coleman should be splitting reps with all the early reps uh, ahead of uh, P. Ryan and Ty Johnson. I never understood the the infatuation of that they had with P. Ryan because as a Gators fan, I watched these games every su- every Saturday, and I did not like LaMichael P. Ryan coming out of Florida. I'm pretty sure I, I had him as a, a late-round grade or maybe even undrafted. I didn't like anything about him coming out. So the fact that he was – is pegged to potentially be a starter for them or get a good portion of the of the early down touches is disappointing but michael carter should plug in right away as a pass catching back really solid option out of the backfield yeah i'll be honest i actually forgot about my boy even though i'd follow him on instagram because he's former iu running back but i forgot tevin coleman had gone there yeah. so really it should be between him and michael carter really should be. i don't think there's going to be a clear-cut starter there. i think they're going to mm-hmm. rotate a lot and use different guys 49ers shit. exactly definitely they will with salah having that background of course coming from the 49ers but then also Corey Davis as a free agent. Now, yes, he was a little bit disappointed when when went fifth in that draft as a wide receiver to the Titans. But I think maybe his best football is ahead of him. That's mm-hmm. what that's kind of what they did in the offseason as far as free agency d- goes. You also bring in Carl Lawson, and you look at players that maybe have been good at times with their teams, but yep. maybe we haven't seen the best and are still only what 25, 26. Mm-hmm. The, their best football in their prime could be ahead of them. So between that and the draft, the Jets infused a lot of talent, and they definitely improved themselves. And they actually look like a competent franchise at the moment. Now it's it's on paper, mm-hmm. so we got to see it play out. We need to see them on NFL Sundays, mm-hmm. and it's going to be a longer season than it ever has been before because we're going to have 18 weeks. We just had the schedule released, I believe, yesterday. So there's 17 games now. It's a whole new ball game, but I like what the Jets did. They seemingly have not only just some key pieces, but they actually seem to have some depth and some options that they definitely did not have over the last two or three years. And that'll be a welcome thing for their fans. That's for sure. And they're giving Zach Wilson an actual shot to succeed. Unlike Sam Darnold, who they, they completely set up for failure. The O-line was trash. Jamison Crowder was your best receiver. That's a damn shame. And he wasn't even healthy a lot of the time. Nothing at tight end, nothing at running back. And you had the worst head coach in, in the NFL. Just just a series of disappointments. Yeah, their, their tight ends still suck, but at least they did help and, the receiver position. And I love their draft. I even love their later picks. Uh, Jamie and Sherwood should play a safety linebacker hybrid role for them. They need linebacker help, so that's nice. It's, it's good that they're getting back C.J. Mosley, who opted out. Or was it opt-out or injury? Maybe both. I don't know. But he didn't play last year is all that really matters. But he's going to be back on middle linebacker to help shore it up. So they'll be better. But this team is still building. I wouldn't get too ahead of myself if I'm a Jets fan. The talent is definitely there. But temper your expectations. The Giants are definitely farther ahead in terms of where teams are than the Jets are. Maybe because they got a little jump on on the rebuild, but and they got they had a better head coach last year, but that's neither here nor there. Um, one thing I will say about the Jets' later picks, I did like the pickup of Brandon Eagles, uh, the corner from Kentucky. 
I, I had him lower on my board, but that was more also because of off the field issues and stuff like that. He should factor in early for them, even as a six round pick, because the corners are pretty, but Bryce Hall might be their best option. But anyway, let's move on from the jets. Let's go to the giants. I know Bob, you touched on them a little bit before, uh, but they also had a solid draft. I know you hated Kadarius Tony, and you can tell us about that in a second, but Ojulari, A plus pick. I loved the pick of Aaron Robinson, the corner from UCF in the third round. I had a, I had him at 48 overall on my board. He, they got him at 71. That man could very well be a starter for them this year. Their secondary is also being rebuilt. They got Bradbury. They got uh, Adore Jackson. Darnay Holmes is a solid option. But outside those three, they really have nothing at the position. So Robinson can really be one of their top three corners from the get. I loved Ellerson Smith from North, uh, Northern Iowa. Small school guy. Had him at 126. Got him at 116. So right in that window of uh, value for me. And, and then even... Uh, Rodarius Williams and Gary Brightwell. Brightwell, I think, will be more special teams and depth because I don't like Devontae Booker and I don't like Elijah Penny backing up Saquon. So if Saquon goes down, maybe Brightwell might see some time. I think he's more of a practice squad special teamer at the moment, but still solid value. And then Rodarius Williams, a corner from Oklahoma State, had him at 131, got him at 201. And that's another guy who has some developmental potential, physical guy, and could also could really uh, factor for them later on in the season. The Giants didn't have a lot of draft picks. Had it not been for the fact that they did make that trade with the, the Bears, I would have put this at potentially a C or C-. minus. But at least they were able to get that first round pick. I think that's going to be huge. Yes, I like the Bears draft, but at the same time, I still don't think that's going to be anything, anything late first round or anything. Even if right. they make the playoffs, I, I don't see the Bears getting far with a rookie quarterback and some of the deficiencies that they still have mm-hmm. on that team and even in the, their front office and with their coach, Matt Nagy. But the Giants definitely improved in the second and third round. As I mentioned before, Ojalary and Robinson both fill needs. They got it good value. And then even with Ellerson Smith, another guy that can rush the pass or badly needed pass rushers. My biggest problem is still, all right, so they telegraph their pick like they have been doing for five years now. Even before Dave Gettleman was a GM, they were doing it with Jerry Reese as the GM. Even going back to 2016 when they took Eli Apple – when they really should have been able to get Jack Conklin or Leonard Floyd, but the Titans and the Bears, not only that the fact that they wanted those guys, but they they were able to, I think the Bears traded up ahead of them and took Floyd. I could be wrong on that, but I feel like they did. But either, yeah, the Bears, but, yeah, they caught Floyd. But either way, they <laughs> they blocked the Giants, and yep. the Giants continually just seem to telegraph their picks. People know who they're going to take. Every so that, year. It's disgusting. So everyone knew that Devontae Smith was the pick at number 11. I do like Devontae Smith. I'm not heartbroken about it because I still feel that we have receiving options between Ingram, between Slayton, Shepard. They have pieces. The pro- and bringing in Kenny Galladay, of course, is a big free agent addition. But to me, going back to 20, first round pick is huge. But taking Kadarius Tony there, I didn't like. I don't hate the player, but I'd rather have him at late first round or early second round. I think they were had their hearts set on Devontae Smith, and then they were like, all right, well, let's take another guy who's another speed weapon that can maybe do multiple things that I guess Smith can. Of course, they still had Smith rated higher on their board, no doubt about it. Right. Uh, Tony's not the pass rusher like that. But to me, still taking a gadget player, I'd rather have someone who – I feel is I f- would feel more comfortable with someone that like Rashad Bateman, where I feel like there's maybe a higher floor. I think Tony could be a good player. I definitely like the explosive speed. He did play at Florida. He is uh, a guy that they depended on aside from Kyle Pitts, and he did work with Kyle Trask at quarterback. That he did. So again, I don't hate the player. I just don't like the value, and I don't think it was as big a need as they necessarily wound up thinking it was. They should have taken a tackle. They could have taken Darisol right there uh, or even Tevin Jenkins. Now, Tevin Jenkins wound up going top of this, or well, I think like seventh pick of the second round to the Bears. So we went a, a little bit later than we really thought he would go. Mm-hmm. But to me, Darisol would have been a great pick. You could have put him at right tackle instead of Solder, or you could even slid him into one of the guard spots if you were so inclined. He winds up going 24 to the Vikings. So I think the Giants really 
it would have been better if they took Darasaw, but at least they redeemed themselves by the fact that they got a first round pick. They got a couple pass rushers and they got a corner in Robinson that I think could compete right away. In the last podcast we did, I said, yeah, they really need a corner like a Farley or Sertan. I think I had Sertan mocked to them. Obviously he wasn't available there. Right. Broncos took him at nine, but besides James Bradbury, they don't really have a legitimate starter you feel comfortable about. I don't care that they signed the Dory Jackson. I don't view him as a piece that, oh yeah, let's just slot him in as our number two corner and he'll be fine. No, they're still going to, I, I, I like a Dory Jackson. I think he could be good, but I don't, there's a reason why a a cornerback needy team got rid of him in the Titans. There's still a lot to prove. He only signed a one-year deal. So there's still a lot to be proven there. So, and then a running back in the sixth round. I'm not going to get crazy about a sixth round pick. Yeah. But what the fuck are they doing? I'm sorry. (laughs) I can't, I can't resist. What, what are we doing? We also signed Devontae Booker in the off season. I just. So it's uh, it's not perfect, but. Yeah, they no, are. They, they, they improve. They improved to maybe like a a B simply because of the first round pick. If not for that first round pick that they got for next year, I'd be putting, especially in a deep draft that you alluded to early on in this podcast, I'd be saying C C minus. I, I wasn't crazy about the Giants draft, but first round pick definitely buoys it. I mean the 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 Giants filled a lot of holes. They got a they got a good corner. They got a couple of corners. They got their pass rusher. Well, they got a couple of pass rushers. Ojolari's the top one, but I really like Ellison Smith's potential. And Kadarius Tony could be a real weapon for them. Daniel Jones will have a legitimate slot receiver. I mean, they had Sterling Shepard, but I've never liked Sterling Shepard. I've always been low on him. And Kadarius Tony steps in right away as their number two receiver. He played mostly out of the slot for Florida. So I wonder if that's where he'll be in the NFL. That's where his uh, best position is, is in the slot. But, dude, Kenny Galladay on the outside, Slayton, and then and then Tony in the slot. You want to talk about not having excuses anymore? Daniel Jones has no excuses. No, not at With all. Barkley coming back. They added, they added uh, Kadarius Tony. The O-line has another year of development in young guys like Shane Lemieux and, and Andrew Thomas and Matt Pert, the, the Evan Engram, Kyle Rudolph. I mean, the pieces are there. Second year in this team system with Jason Garrett and, and uh, Joe Judge as his uh, coordinator and head coach. So the continuity is there. It's time to take the next step. Stop turning the ball over. Get your shit together. Get the ball off quicker. You're nobody. You're not looking like anything special right now, Dan Jones. So now you've got pieces. Now it's time to step up. Otherwise, you're out, and this the coach is out, and it's time to rebuild again, like you have a lot. Well, maybe not the coach, but definitely the GM. Easily the GM. So, I mean, let's move on from the Giants. Let's go to the Buffalo Bills. Yes, they are Northern New York, and people make fun of them all the time for not really being a New York team, but they are a New York team. And they had a solid, not spectacular draft. Greg Rousseau in the first round was a solid pickup. Very bills of them to do. They like having uh, their options on the defensive line. They like having pass rushing options. But uh, Rousseau, AJ Vanessa, who they took last year in the second round. Uh, Carlos Basham, who they took in the second round this year. You got options now, along with Mario Addison and Jerry Hughes. You have five edge rushers you can rotate, keep everybody fresh, keep the pressure coming. Rousseau, you could move him inside on passing downs on third and long. He's he like we talked about uh, during the pre-draft. Rousseau did his best work as an inside rusher, looking very very disruptive from the inside. But he's not a full-time D tackle, but he'll fit right in with this team. So their their D-line gets bolstered. They added depth in the secondary. I like the offensive tackle pieces that they added uh, in Spencer Brown out of Northern Iowa in the third round. I had him at number 66 on my board. They took him at 93rd overall. And then Tommy Doyle later on out of Miami of Ohio. I had him a little ranked, ranked a little bit lower, but still the fifth round for a backup tackle is not a bad, is never a bad pick. So... They made some good moves. They add to the team. 
They had a lot of talent last year. They have even more now. You get another year of development with Josh Allen. You get to see if this team takes that next step. They added Emmanuel Sanders in the offseason. This team is ready to roll. Oh, absolutely. I definitely like the Bills draft. And as you said, it's definitely very Bills of them to take a couple pass rushers. And, so but Bills. I think it was ne- needed when you consider the old heads they have at DN, like Jerry Hughes and Mario Addison. Even Vernon Butler has been a disappointment. Granted, he's at D-tackle. But I think adding those players, and I think the Saints are going to rue the day that they took Peyton Turner over Gregory Rousseau. I know Turner was flying up draft boards out of Houston, but to me, Rousseau was an absolute stud a couple years ago for Miami. Yes, he sat out due to COVID last year, but I just love his profile. You, I like him more than you going into the, in the draft process. I think you, you went about where you liked him to go, though, like late first round. I would have, I, to me, I would have picked him in that 10, 20 range. I mean, we talked about this uh, before we went on the air, and I had Rousseau at number 29 on my big board, yeah. and he goes 30. Exactly. It was perfect. Now, the only thing I will say, though, as much as I like some of their picks, especially getting Rousseau and Basham and bolstering that D-line, and that's how we know you – you can win in the NFL. We saw the Bucks do it last year. We've seen the Giants do it in the past, the Ravens. A lot of teams are successful because you can rush the passer. But I would have liked to, to maybe trade up and either take a receiver that is a big receiver because you're looking at Diggs and Beasley and Sanders. No one that you, in, a, in a cold game late in January that you really feel is going to win a, some kind of jump ball scenario or just beat his man and out-muscle him. I would have liked him to maybe jump the Ravens, trade up to 25 or 26 with the Jaguars or the Browns and take him Rashad Bateman. That would have been real nice. Plus, because the Ravens are also their one of their main competitors Mm -hmm. uh, in the AFC. Nice, dude. (laughs) Or even maybe take a tackle. Now, yeah, they could have maybe taken Tevin Jenkins there, or maybe they could have traded up, get someone like Darisol. But I don't love Deion Dawkins and Darrell Williams as their tackle. So to me, Yes, it's nice to bolster the defensive line, but I think they were a little conservative. I still think they overall had a very good draft for all the pieces you mentioned, they, they improving both the defensive and offensive line. I think those were the priorities. I'm obviously talking about the offensive line, but to me, I would like to get someone that could have competed for one of those tackle spots and maybe been a starter or at least maybe slid into guard and, and play over someone like John Feliciano. Uh, that that's why I would like to see them do, do but it, overall still a good draft for the bills they're still primed to be the best team in the AFC East uh they de- definitely got better but I still don't know if they had enough sand I think they could have maybe maybe gotten that receiver opposite digs like a Bateman in the first round or even a play well I would have rather have a big receiver but even maybe taking Elijah Moore at 30 and have someone that could be even more dynamic than someone like Cole Beasley. I mean, that would have been, <laughs> that would have been something real special, really take that offense to the next level. Um, but oh, and I, even when the running backs, we thought mm-hmm. maybe they would take Etienne. Well, yeah, we were talking about that because they're one of their big things this whole off season. They were talking about getting more explosive on both sides of the ball. They really didn't get that much more explosive on either side of the ball, but it sounded good. Right. So that's, that's just the thing I worry about is because, Yes, you win by rushing the passer and having a good quarterback, but especially lately, the, the fact that you see so many playmakers across the NFL and you saw what the Chiefs and Bucks were able to do and make the, make the Super Bowl, you do need explosive playmakers. Yeah, they have Diggs, but outside of Diggs, uh, Beasley and old Emmanuel Sanders. Yeah, they're, hope, they're Knox, hoping Gabriel Davis takes that next step for them and, and Knox – steps up and becomes that athletic tight end that seems to be the rage these days we'll see they're going to run the ball josh josh uh, allen's going to run around do his thing and they're going to play the elite defense so that thing they'll be fine but yeah i would like to see them make a little more splash moves or something like that make it more exciting but listen this this team isn't exciting this team isn't uh, flashy they are disciplined they are well coached and they are built to make a postseason run so I know Bills fans are happy. I know Benny is happy. He'll be even happier if they make or win the Super Bowl. But let's move on from this, uh, from the breakdown of the New York teams. And let's put a bow on this, shall we? Absolutely. Let's so we've talked a lot about a lot of different teams, a lot of different players. We've gone up and down the board, sprinkled some love, sprinkled on some hate. But 
we are at the end. So now, Bob, it comes time. Who had your least favorite draft this season? Well, a lot of contenders for that. Yeah. Now it would be this. I was going to go with this one, but it's too easy. I'll just mention it in passing. Texans, absolutely dreadful. But obviously they didn't have top picks. They didn't have a first or second rounder. Bill O'Brien completely screwed that franchise up. Sean Watson not only seems like he needs to be traded, but he also needs some therapy, apparently. And the Texans just are a joke of a franchise. Took Davis Mills in the third round, quarterback out of what? Stanford? Yep. And they tried to pretend like, oh, well, we just evaluate the best players, blah, blah, blah. blah, blah no, blah. that's clearly because – you're worried about Deshaun Watson, whether you get suspended or not, or you wind up trading him. It's over for that guy. And even though, yeah, we, we think Davis Mills might be a good prospect, it's a joke. They have so many needs. I don't I don't think going for quarterback with their first selection in in the draft for them was the right way to go. Packers I also didn't like, but yeah, I really don't like the Raiders draft. They did get a need, but they went with no value. Alex Leatherwood should have been a mid second rounder at best. So that was gross. I didn't like that pick at all whatsoever by the Raiders. Yeah, it was it was it was a typical Raiders pick. And then since this regime took over, they just do whatever whatever they want to do. And then I know they need secondary help. And I, I again I don't hate the player. We're gonna kind of touch on what we talked about before um on the last podcast, but Trayvon Mulrig. I just don't think it's enough of an impact player for them. I like Ooh, him. I love that pick, man. See, I, see, I, I don't. I think they could have gone so many other ways because they still have so much they need on the offensive line. Uh, they could still use, I mean, a- anything else on defense, but just safety is not, again, like, yes, it's nice to have a good player, and hopefully Trayvon Mulrig is a good player for the Raiders. But to me, I'm trying to hit more of a home run when I have such a dearth of talent mm. on defense. It's yeah, Max Crosby's a good player, but Cleveland Farrell so far looks like a bust. That's got rid of Maurice Hurst for God knows what reason. Corey Littleton was disappointing as a free agent acquisition in his first season. Their corners just stink. I, to me, I would have rather gone for a home run type pick if I'm the Raiders, especially because I reach. Yes, it's a need. So if Leatherwood turns out to be a good player, it'll be nice. Yeah, of course. But clearly not a good value. And then to take a safety in the second round when you have so many other needs, I'd rather try to improve my pass rush or get a three down linebacker or get potentially maybe a shutdown corner or at least someone who's very good. So to me, I I just really did not like the Raiders draft at all. And I don't think they should have stuck to their board and their, their guts like they have, because it's, it's starting to look like John Gruden and Mike Mayock don't know what they're doing. They don't, they don't seem to have a good grasp on value with these picks they just do whatever they want stick to their board strictly and and it is what it is but word around the league after the draft was look you know some of the rumors i was reading online is that a lot of teams look at them are like they don't know what value is they don't know it's one thing to stick to your board and have your judgments on a player it's another to take a guy at 17 overall that probably would have been there in the second round or at the end of the first round. You could have traded back five or six slots, gotten an extra second or third round or fourth round pick or something and build from there. I'm a little less disgusted with the Raiders. I mean, it's easy to pick the Texans. They're, they're ass, they're roster's butt. The Raiders also took three safeties between the second and fourth round. Which kind of shows you where their head was with their secondary. Now, one of those safeties, Divine Diablo... I don't know if I'm saying that last name right, but that's how it's spelled. So you know how I am with names. But uh, the the safety linebacker hybrid player out of Virginia Tech, he's probably going to play linebacker for them. He's a bigger guy, and he has struggled in space. So it makes sense that they they would want to move him up, maybe have him gain 10 pounds and play linebacker, outside linebacker full time. I'm not as upset with their pit, their their picks as Bob is. I don't like Leatherwood there. But Mo Reagan in the second round was a steal. Uh, Malcolm Koontz, the uh, edge rusher from Buffalo, he got a lot of love coming into the draft. He could have easily gone higher. 
but getting him in the third round was really solid value. And I, I honestly, overall, I like what they did. Tyree Gillespie in the fourth round. I didn't like where they took him. I think it was a little early, but he does have starter potential down the line. So I don't want to, I don't want to hate on them too much, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to hate on the Dallas Cowboys because I alluded to this earlier and I got to say it out loud again. I hate everything about their draft class. They had a couple of solid value picks. I like the pick of Micah Parsons. He'll slide in right away in that piss poor linebacking core. He should be a playmaker for him. And that was a solid pick right there. But Kelvin Joseph was a reach in the second round. Aside from the off the field issues, potentially, it's a kid who only played in 20 games in his college career. So there's questions on a couple of fronts there. He's someone, like I said earlier, they could have had later. They they took uh, Osa Odekizua. I really hope I'm saying that right. Odekizua? That's it's the like one. when uh, the Giants took his, his brother. brother. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they took him, the defensive lineman out of UCLA, in the third round. Then they doubled up back-to-back picks. They took uh, Chauncey Golston, uh, defensive lineman, D end from Iowa. But he's a guy I didn't. I had ranked way down on my board. I had him as a sixth, seventh round pick, undrafted, free agent priority. The talent is there. I just, the value isn't. And I like that they address the defense. They had to. Their defense is porous and still has gaping holes all over the place. This class won't fix that. But they reached on a lot of picks. Even Nashawn Wright. I don't even have him ranked. That's a undrafted guy in my book. Nashawn Wright, not, not, nothing against him, but at 99 overall, you're telling me at 99 overall, with all the other talent on the board, if you're the Cowboys, there's you, you don't want Elijah Molden, the corner from Washington that went one pick later. You don't want Efedi Melifonwu, the defensive back that the Lions took out of Syracuse. Give me a break, dude. You don't take Ernest Jones, linebacker from Carolina, South Carolina. I mean, these are all guys who went right after their pick and all guys who could have slotted in as potential starters in, in, in week one mm-hmm. or, you know, as rookies and have key roles. And instead, they went with a bunch of guys who I had later round draft picks, uh, later round grades on. And I mean, good for them that they recognize the need to upgrade their defense, but gross. And then I love Jabril Cox. It had to be Cox in the fourth <laughs> round. I had him at 55th on my board. They got him at 115. That's the best pick they made the whole draft. The rest of the class is, is sixth and seventh round picks, unranked guys and reaches just all over the place. I hate it. Now let's put a bow on it. The cherry on top. Who had your favorite draft, Bob? Well, I know I had the Bears and the Chargers, some of my favorites, so it might be the Chargers. I had one more. I really love the Jets draft. (sighs) Got to go with the Chargers, because at least I feel like they can compete next year and be a contender. So, as I mentioned earlier, you get value and need with your first two-round picks, and those are the guys that you expect to contribute Mm -hmm. right away. So, getting Rashawn Slater at 13 – should slide in right away, potentially as their starting left tackle and potentially a cornerstone at that position for years to come. Then you get Asante Samuel, badly need another corner. Casey Hayward's no longer there. Mm -hmm. So Asante Samuel, we mentioned earlier in the other podcast, he can play right away. We see guys with those former, those bloodlines. They don't suck usually, especially when they're high draft picks. They, they, they produce Mm -hmm. right away. Mm -hmm. The list goes on and on. And then you look at the other pieces that they got, like Josh Palmer and Trey McKitty, again, supporting their franchise quarterback and Justin Herbert, not just relying on Keenan Allen and Mike Williams, especially because Mike, <laughs> Williams, especially because Mike Williams always gets hurt. Yep, uh, That's another reason why I like that pick. So to me, they, they had a really good draft. There may be some others that people like more on paper, especially with the Jets or Jaguars having so many picks, but – Let's be honest, the Jets and Jaguars probably aren't going to be contending for a playoff spot. Mm -mm. The Chargers showed you some signs last year that they're trending in the right direction. They need to be healthy, of course, but they have some playmakers on both sides of the ball. I just mentioned a bunch on offense, but Mm -hmm. they have Joey Bosa. They have uh, Melvin Ingram. Derwin James hopefully can finally be healthy. I I really like the Chargers, and I think they're trending up. It's a tough division, but to me, they're definitely better than the Broncos. And they're better than the Raiders. Now, they're not as good as the Chiefs, of course. But mm-hmm. when you consider, as I mentioned before, seven teams making the playoffs, I think the Chargers, as long as Justin Herbert's healthy, 
That's the key. He looks like a stud and a franchise quarterback. The Chargers had a great draft, and to me, they're my favorite. I love it, man. I know Jets fans, G Bass, Nahum, they're gonna be listening to this and they're gonna they're gonna be smiling. They might even agree with you. I am going to go with the Cleveland Browns. Now, this is another team, like Bob's talking about teams on the rise. This is a team that's on the rise. We saw what they did in the postseason. They got a playoff win. They played the Chiefs well. But at the end of the day, they fell, they fell just a wee bit short, just a little Dwayne of an issue there. So what did they do this offseason? Oh, they doubled down. They upgraded where they needed to upgrade. And they had one hell of a draft. Greg Newsom, corner from Northwestern, had him at 23rd overall on my board. They take him at 26. Again, fantastic value. Perfect. Right where I had him. Fits a need right away. Should be a starting outside corner from them from week one. Physical, just quality, quality pick. Fills a hole. Good talent. Good value. A+. plus. Jeremiah Owusu-Koromoa. Yeah. linebacker Notre Dame I had him 20th on my big board could have gone hot could have been higher got him at 52nd overall because of I want to say injury concerns was the main reason he fell if I remember correctly that was definitely one of the reasons but also just the tweener fact that they foolish they're not sure and teams are like weary of what he position he's going to be foolish because on tape this kid this kid does it all he's a hard hitter he's at sideline to sideline athlete He's willing to stick his nose in there. He's a little undersized, but it, he's willing to stick his nose in there in the run game. He's covered running backs, tight ends, slot receivers. He's an athletic marvel at the linebacker position. He's a perfect fit for the NFL. Today's NFL, the way it's going, teams are going to have five defensive backs on the field 70% of the time and only you know two linebackers maybe. He'll be one of those two linebackers, and he'll fit like a glove. But it doesn't stop there. The rest of the class, solid. Anthony Schwartz, receiver from Auburn. I had him at 93. He goes 91. One of the fastest players, if not the fastest player in this draft class. A potential Olympic sprinter, for God's sakes. Quality addition. They needed speed at the receiver position. And they don't need to rely on him right away. They can let him develop and give him give him some time to get used to the speed and physicality of the, of the NFL. But that was a real solid addition. James Hudson, another one. Great value. 83rd on my board, got him at 110. Uh, Tony Fields, uh, uh, Demit- and, and Demetric Felton, the receiver slash running back from UCLA. I had him at 115 on my board. They got him in the sixth round at 211. He's a running back. He was a running back in college. I want to say he practiced at slot receiver in the senior bowl, if I remember correctly. Um, but regardless, Slot receiver, running back, can move him around. Very solid piece. I was shocked that he dropped to the sixth round. But he's another one. They need weapons, they need options, and they have them. Uh, just a team taking the next step, that's what you want to accomplish. And they did. So I got to give them love. There were a few other ones that I liked. I'm actually going to give props to the Lions. I hated at first that they took two defensive linemen back-to-back instead of taking a receiver in a very deep and rich receiver class. But I like how it went. They rebuilt the D-line, got some good, solid interior options. Melifon Wu could have been a second-round pick. They got him at the end of the third. Steel, in my book, I had him at 37th overall. Goes, goes 101. And this is a rare, rare thing for me, folks. I'm actually praising the Lions. So mark this down. Remember this day. I'll forget about it very quickly because I hate my team. But it was a very impressive draft. I actually really like it. It was one of the better drafts that any team had. Uh, I've, I've looked around online and a lot of publications have them definitely top 10. Some even have them top five. So it was a good start for this new regime. It gives me hope as a Lions fan. Absolutely should. And the Lions, I think, did have a good draft as well. I didn't like the Giants as much, but I still think overall solid things, especially when you consider the next year's first round draft pick. The local teams did well. We talked about them at length. Uh, we didn't get to everybody, but we got to a lot of teams, which is nice. We got to touch on a lot of teams. We didn't even talk about a team like the Bengals. We're not, I'm not going to go crazy on them now, but I kind of like what they did. Oh, yeah. Even though I think Sewell should have been the pick and protect their investment, but I think Jamar Chase was a great pick, for example. Uh, team him with his quarterback from college and 
they definitely had a lot of depth and a lot of picks and they, they bolstered their squad too. So those two Ohio teams, the Browns and the Bengals, I think did themselves a lot of favors. Whereas even in that division, I think the Steelers actually had a bad draft. I love Najee Harris and he's great for the fantasy community, but I don't love taking a running back there. I know PFF, for example, hates it, especially, uh, but I think the Steelers definitely got worse over the off season between, you know, free agency and the draft. So that, there are a lot of things changing in that AFC North, for example. That AFC North might be the best division in football. They, you got it's definitely up there. Three legitimate playoff teams. I mean, the NFC West should be the best. AFC but West yeah. should be the best. But the, the North has three legitimate playoff teams, two of which are legitimate Super Bowl contenders. Actually, even the Steelers can be considered right. a Super Bowl contender. If they're healthy and Big Ben is on it, they could do something real special. You'd never want to sleep on the Steelers. You'd have three teams in this division, win 10 games. It could be something real nice. But uh, it's, it's going to be fun, and I'm looking forward to seeing how the offseason goes. This was a lot that we discussed. Thank you guys for sticking with us. I do want to remind you guys that we are on Twitter. We are on Instagram. Give us a follow. Give us a like. We will follow back. Reach out to us. Hop in the DMs. We could talk sports, whatever you want. Bob and I love, you know, football, basketball, baseball, hockey. I'm a big soccer fan. So we can touch on whatever sport, whatever topic you want to touch on. Bob, what's the handle? Those handles for both are DB talking sports, D as in Dan, B as in Bob. Also, what would be great, even more important than that, is if you subscribe on whatever podcast site, especially if it's iTunes or whatever site you use. That's great because also, I usually share it on my personal Facebook page or maybe we also need to be better about sharing it on Twitter and Instagram. But basically if you subscribe, you'll see it right when I upload it. So even say if I, I'm not going to edit this podcast tonight and put it up, but on nights that I do do that, you'll see it right when I'm done processing. You'll you'll be, you'll, you'll see it right away and it will get that notification uh, that it's added to the to the site and that where, wherever you use google us like dan mentioned uh you can find us dan and bob talking sports yep so we appreciate all any and all feedback as well absolutely send us a dm there you go you know write us you can even comment on any of those sites and we'll likely see it i'm sure i'll find it mm-hmm. so we appreciate everyone making it this far if you're Woo. still listening Woo. but thank you again and please follow and subscribe we really would love to hear from you also you'll find me on the grueling truth.com uh, i can be contributing uh written articles podcasts our podcast will be on there i'll be doing some youtube videos and stuff like that working with them i'm pretty excited about i've already got some stuff posted on there i had my mock draft posted there my rankings my best players available uh, i put my lions draft review up there so that's uh, up current i believe that was posted yesterday so Give me a like on there, share with Facebook, Twitter, your friends, your fam, your fiends, <laughs> get us out there. We appreciate you guys. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Dan Kornhauser. I'm Bobby Hunt. We'll catch you guys later.